<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask Us Anything with your ID co-founders here in Czech. We also have some amazing ID teaching team members here to answer your questions. This is a free webinar that we do on a weekly basis to just pull you into our little vortex of anatomy and answer some of your questions ID style. Uh, we have with us tonight myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Kathy Dooley, uh, one of your co-founders of Immaculate Dissection, ID. Uh, Dr. Anna Falkmer, tell them about yourself. Hello, Dr. Anna Falkmer, one of your co-founders with the amazing Kathy and Danny. And speaking of which, Danny Quirk. Hey everyone, uh, Danny here, one of the co-founders as well with, with uh, these two lovely people. And uh, yeah, just the, the artist for the, for the, for the group. So. <laughs> We're so happy that we're all here because we love each other so much and we love that you guys are here. We have to include some amazing teaching team members that have stayed on with us tonight to talk to you. Uh, Dr. Fol uh, sorry, Dr. Folk, we already covered. Uh, Dr. Chada, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Hi, I'm Dr. Monica Chada. I'm from Toronto, I'm a chiropractor and I, my first ID Ask Us Anything was last week and it was really exciting, so I'm happy to be back. Oh, I didn't chase you away. That's so great. Uh, so glad that you came back. We have a little bit too much fun with these. We get so excited for them every week. So we're so happy that you're here. And Lisa Burnfield, you've been on with us before. We're so happy to have you back. Hi, I'm Lisa Burnfield. I'm also from Toronto. We uh, have a good, good Toronto component. Um, I'm a physiotherapist. And uh, yeah, again, I, like Monica, my first one was last week. So I'm happy to uh, be here again. So glad that you're here. And what a special guest we have tonight in Dr. Chris Kirby, one of my classmates in chiropractic school, if you can believe that. He sat behind me and somehow did not get sick of me. I don't know how that happened. So Dr. Kirby, can you tell them more about yourself? Hi, I'm Dr. Kirby. I'm a chiropractor from Southern Missouri. Um, just been a part of the ID team now for uh, two years. Uh, just loving every bit of it and just adding it to the practice every day when I can. <laughs> yeah, when we're allowed to go. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. Uh, I, I know from a clinical perspective, if I didn't have ID, I have no idea how I'd be doing telehealth right now. Uh, immaculate dissection is something that I am so proud to belong to with these amazing people. And it has changed my clinical practice in a way that leaves me so open, you know, to be able to do telehealth. So, so, so happy to share some of our tidbits of knowledge with you guys tonight and answer some of your questions. Uh, so, uh, before we hit it off, I wanted to let you guys know that we'll be giving away a $50 USD coupon off of our online coursework or in-person coursework, should you choose to take us up on it, if you were the first to answer correctly one of our anatomy questions based upon some of the topics we talk about tonight. So if you go down to the very bottom of this Zoom call, you'll see a green button that says share screen. And then to the left of it, you'll see a chat box. And you'll want to type any questions you have for us in that chat box. And later on when we do our contest, you're gonna to wanna to answer one of the questions and be the first to answer using that same chat box. So you may wanna practice right now by asking us a question with the chat box. And we would love to answer it live here. Uh, we, we would very, very much like to, to pull you in to the way that we think and hopefully answer some of your questions that have been lingering on. So as you're thinking of your questions, we do have some questions from uh, the gallery uh, of people that uh, have offered us some via email and in, on social media. Uh, we had a question from last week that didn't get answered because the person uh, couldn't get on the call. And uh, she was asking a lot about um, some of our spinal cues. And she was asking why we chose the spinal cues, neck long, chin tucked, chest wide, ribs down, ASIs, PSIs even. And, and she was like, well, I, I, I'm usually coached to do a posterior pelvic tilt because too, too many people are too anteriorly tilted. And so I thought we should answer that question. It's a really, really good one. Um, the reason why we do neck long, chin tuck, chest wide, ribs down, ASIS, PSIS relatively even in our Vimeos, or sorry, our videos on our uh, Instagram and on Facebook is because we're trying to create spinal load share and preservation of the cervical and lumbar lumbosis and the thoracic and sacral kyphoses. The reason why we maintain those curves is because it decreases 
ground force contact pressure being placed upon one spot in the spine. And it also helps with axial compressive lobes from gravity being placed on just one part of the spine. The, the kyphoses and lordoses create that smart spring that allows for you to dissipate force up and down, much like the coil on your mattress. So our spine is created and evolved in that way to be able to buttress those forces so that the spine doesn't take the hit. The reason why we don't want the spine to take the hit is because the spine is responsible for innervating everything that moves us. And so if you have a cervical compression, that might affect your brachial plexus and the way that you can move your arms. If you have a lumbosacral compression, it affects your entirety of your lower extremity. So we just wanna make sure that you guys understand our load shared cues are, are basically in an attempt to protect the spine at all times and prevent any kind of neurological tension on roots that might go to peripheral nerves and then out the system. We do understand that there is a tendency when you're an upright biped to have an anterior tilt because of that gravitational force of forward ambulation. We don't walk backwards. If we walked backwards, we'd have a tendency towards a posterior tilt. We tend to walk more in a sagittal plane and walk forwards, which means we're transmitting force from the heel to the forefoot. So because of that, there's a little bit of an anterior tilt all the time. That said, you're controlling it by ASIS, PSIS, relatively even based upon the majority of human tasks. If you posterior tilt, you might lose that lordosis and then alter your cues up the kinetic chain. And, and I know you probably want to piggyback on this because you teach the rectus femoris iliacus portion in ID2, and you talk a lot about anterior tilt. So maybe you can elaborate for us. Yeah, I mean, you know, really with the with the IDQs, it's interesting because I think there's such a great um, series of checks and balances, right? Because it, ultimately, it is protecting the spinal curvatures that you earned. And so, um, a lot of times when people, you know, are, think that they're moving one segment, they're really moving something else. And so, when people start to tuck, I mean, I've I've been, you know, observing this in just a lot of online movement classes and things like that. We, you know, it's not a new idea to have your neck long or your chest wide, right? Like the, these aren't new concepts. I you hear bits and pieces of this across the board within rehab, within movement, but then the way in which they're all sort of keeping each other in check, ASIS, PSIS relatively even becomes really nice because it is, um, it's, it's about the relativity of that. I mean, for everybody, yes, there may be a tendency to go into an anterior pelvic tilt. Um, it, some of that can be very sports specific, like we see in an athletic stance. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's the ground force contact of your feet are also going to sort of proprioceptively cue where your hips are in space. But when we see people cue this sort of posterior pelvic tilt, what they're ultimately doing is they're sacrificing that lordosis. And a couple weeks ago on this call, um, somebody asked, well, is it better to have that anterior head carriage or hinge back on one point and not have the neck long? And it was such a great question. I think it was on our first Ask Us Anything. It was a good question because it's like, well, excessive movement in one direction or another isn't any better or worse. It's still deviating from neutral. And so, you know, cueing a posterior pelvic tilt um, it, it's still kind of pushing you in a, a, an excessive extreme end range in one direction, just like an excessive anterior pelvic tilt. So we cue, you know, we find ways to, to find ASIS, PSIS, and then make them relatively even, understanding that dynamic movement allows us to still have, you know, the necessary movement there to move us through space, but the net outcome should ultimately be neutral. Um, and it's to set the, the spine up for success because once you start to lose lordosis in one part of the spine, you're going to start to see a trickle up effect um, with other segments of the spine. And you worked really hard to earn those curves. Right on. It's beautifully stated. Uh, do we have um, anybody else from the gallery that wants to answer? Just raise your hand, uh, ID team, and I'll unmute you. Anything to add to that? That was awesome. Nada? Yeah, Danny. Hi, Danny. Yeah, no. Hey, hey, everyone. No, but yeah, just kind of as kind of what was said there, though. I mean, like keeping keeping these cues at the spine 
as aligned as possible. That's that's going to allow for just the most proper movement of everything, everything down the road from there. If you start, if you, because again, like that, it's, it's creating that biomechanic advantage the way the body was in essence designed to move properly and safely. So if you start kind of getting some issues in these areas, like the compensation patterns that are going to form kind of all throughout, are are, are just going to cause cause more damage down the road. Love it. Very very well said. Um, awesome. Uh, anybody else want to add anything before we move to the next question? Monica, Lisa, Curb, how are you doing? Yeah, I'll unmute you. Monica, I think you might have to unmute yours. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. I think you guys all touched on it quite well. Um, just to add to my own thought there is the idea that like you don't want to force yourself into a posterior pelvic tilt or any position really. What you're doing is creating dynamism and ability. And the more you go into neck long, chin back, chest wide, ribs down, ASIS, PSIS relatively even, the, the better your body will start to train into it rather than telling yourself, hey, you know what, I'm just going to post your pelvic toe and flatten my back into the ground, which, you know, is atrocious anyway, but you're, you're not forcing it, which is really nice and feels nice in your body when you're training that. Monica is saying this because she's probably had to fix quite a few people who have done a posterior pelvic tilt and told to shove their low back into the floor, being in a supine position, and then had to rehabilitate them for either, you know, facet or capsule injury or potentially, you know, flexion intolerance, you know, and, and discogenic issues. So it is not smart to be telling people to push their low back into the floor and do a posterior pelvic tilt, and which is why we're so... Uh, adamant about ASIS, PSIS relatively even, which means that you're not letting it tip too much in one direction, including shoving someone posteriorly. I love that you said that, Monica, a relative dynamism. Really, really good. Martha made the comment, a really smart one in the chat box, that a lot of people in her field uh, teach a posterior pelvic tilt. And I think they mean what we mean. I think, I hope that they mean ASIS, PSIS relatively even, which means not too much anterior tilt but they're trying to get them to even out with posteriorly tilting rather than tilted, but then the patient takes it too far. I mean, Anna and I share a patient who I'm sure would not mind at all as mentioning this, that she heard me say ASI is PSI is even, and she heard posterior pelvic tilt, and she stood at her desk during you know an eight-hour workday with a posterior pelvic tilt, and then she basically put a strain on her posterior joint facet capsule so much that she had to get a cortisone injection because she could barely stand. And so some of your patients will take that cue and they, they will go crazy with it. Even though I said ASI is PSI is relatively even and then showed her how to measure herself, she still heard it as posterior tilt. And then, so you have to be really careful with your communications of all of those cues being the same importance. Neck is not more important as being long, as chin being back, as chest being wide, as as ribs being down, as hips being even, it, it's a really important that we load share so that not one part of the, the spine is taking the hit. So I thought that was a really fantastic question. I was sorry that we didn't get to it last week, but i um, super thankful to have this opportunity to answer it now. Um, uh, Lisa, did you have something to add? I'm sorry. I think I saw your hand go up. I think you covered it. It was okay. basically just that, you know, when we kind of force ourselves into a position, we're stealing from other other things that could kind of down the road run into or create bigger problems. Yeah, I like that. You said it better than I did. Like, you don't want to rob one area to pay another area. It's about share. We're, in ID, we're about sharing, sharing knowledge, but load sharing in the spine too. Uh, another great question we had last week was from Doria. She couldn't get on the call also. And she was asking about... Uh, how we in ID handle patients uh, with osteopenia and osteoporosis, how we would treat them differently. And, uh, and she also asked about the DEXA scan and why I have such a problem with it. <laughs> so, um, and this might be controversial. Uh, so I'm not afraid if you guys aren't. Uh, I know that the DEXA scan is the gold standard test for bone density. And I do believe it has issues. Um, the measurement of cortical bone doesn't necessarily tell me the strength and endurance of a patient under load. And so a lot of my patients, they'll start to get diagnoses of osteopenia and even osteoporosis based upon their DEXA scan, but they're weight bearing, they're consuming enough calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, they're getting their sunlight. They, they don't understand why the DEXA still shows that they are osteopenic and they worry about their bone density. And I remember hearing a great talk with uh, Dr. Stu McGill, and he talked about trabecular tressing, that the fact that in DEXA scan, we don't really measure 
the scaffolding in the house, we're just kind of measuring the house by its siding. And then patients are put on things like Phosphamax, which will increase your DEXA score, but does not increase the fortitude of your bone. If you've seen people with diseases where, you know, phosphorus kind of replaces, you know, the calcium in bones, the bone is very chalky and they're actually more at risk for fracture. So uh, I don't necessarily think that the bone that you're getting with something like Phosphamax is bone that you want. And so uh, I try to calm the, the fear that people have around the DEXA. When they have osteopenia or osteoporosis, I tell them, well, what are the things that you can do to prevent yourself from fracture? You can learn how to load share, learn how to fall, get up and down off the ground so that when you do fall, you can get back up, learn how to properly fall so that you don't put all your pressure into one spot and fracture bones. Uh, I think we talked last week about how very lucky I am that I have trained that in advance when I fell down a flight of stairs in last July. So um, you do have to worry about falls and that you should train for the fall. And that's something I focus a lot on with the get up that we teach in ID2. And that's basically teaching someone how to get up and down off the ground. And I don't care if their DEXA scan is... Um, is showing them that they're osteopenic or osteoporotic that does not change the fact that they are getting up and down off that floor. They're going to learn how to do it. They're going to learn how to do it safely. And their own body weight is load. And because of that piezoelectric effect of them hitting the ground with their feet when they walk and them getting up and down off the floor, that is weight bearing exercise, which is very important for the osteopenic or osteoporotic patient. Now, Anna, you practice Chinese medicine and you're a rehab specialist. I know you have a lot to say on this topic. So I'm going to have you take it from here. Um, I think that I, I completely agree with everything like the DEXA scans and sort of their self limitations are, you know, it, it, they kind of go back to that old saying of like, you can't judge a book by its cover, like there's limitations to what it's actually looking at. Um, and it also doesn't give you a complete enough clinical picture, right? I mean, you can have people who've had these sort of habits long term. Um, to the point where they've had various injuries, maybe they've had to take a bunch of steroid shots or something like that can also affect the outcome of a DEXA scan. If they have got long-term history use of, of, of steroids, same with hormones and things like that. And also Did I've cut out? Wait, now you're muted. <laughs> We lost you at also. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry, Anna, we lost you at also. Also, uh, the limitations of what a DEXA scan, the, the regions that a DEXA scan will actually look at are fairly selective, right? They'll, they'll, they'll look at like usually the lumbar spine and a, like the, the neck of the femur. Sometimes they'll look at the ankle. Sometimes they'll look at fingers and wrists. But it's not, you know, I mean, it's just, it's very compartmentalized. It's not a systemic overlook. And we don't have enough information based on this one finding. Um, you know, Chinese medicine talks about um, kidney support being something that really helps to protect the integrity of your bones. And we could certainly see how that would fit in if somebody has some sort of adrenal um, suppression due to steroid use, due to hormonal fluctuations. I mean, it's, it's the same kind of song and dance, just in a slightly different language, but you're still seeing all the limitations there um, clinically when you, when you don't have a full picture of something, you just have some data, but maybe not necessarily what to do with it. I mean, it really does kind of come back to just judging that book by its cover where you're just, you're looking at some cortical tissue and that's it. And that's, you, I, I don't know, the idea that you can derive this whole complex story about a person um, is, is really interesting because I, I think it's just, it's very limited. And, you know, to Doria's question about how do we treat them differently, we don't. <laughs> we put them through the same assessments. And, you know, if we know that there's some areas of vulnerability, it does give us some insight as to maybe what their movement has been like up to a certain point, you know, um, maybe it gives us some insight into other systemic factors or old injuries um, where a fracture could occur possibly, um, but even more reason to train exactly like Kathy said, the ability to get on and off the ground and to go back to our ID cues. Like we're going to start to sound like broken records here, but you know, having that spinal neutral position, is really, really, really going to help. I mean, a person that can find spinal neutral 
with osteopenia versus someone who can't is going to fare, fare a whole lot better if they happen to fall or um, you know, go into a compromising position. But I love that you said that, Anna, because I asked them about which part of the dex are you scared about? I'm scared about the femur. Yeah. I'm scared about a hip break. I go, great. So ID correctives are always about load share, about you never going into one spot with the maximum force. And so if someone's worried about like a stress fracture becoming a full fracture because they have osteopenia, osteoporosis, then that just fortifies everything that we're saying in idea about load share, that we want to teach you how to femorally centrate, that we want to teach you how to use your foot to, to strengthen the muscles of your hip to control your femur and, and tibial position, that we want to teach you core stability to hold up your pelvis so that when you do fall, you have multiple points of contact that you can hold on to and that you're not falling onto your big old butt and breaking your femur when it has osteopenia slash osteoporosis. And so a lot of people are fearful because they had the fear of God put into them. Oh, you've got osteoporosis. You better be careful. You better drink, you know, consume your calcium and, and something they were also wrong about as far as calcium supplementation. So it just, it just trickles down into a misinformation that becomes, you know, a, a, a scare situation, not scare tactic. They're not trying to scare them for some kind of purpose to sell Phosphomax. I really don't think that's what's happening. I think that Phosphomax is just their answer to a question mm -hmm. they don't really know the answer to. And instead, I think that we do have an answer that if they're managing things with diet, uh, hormone therapy, uh, Chinese medicine, that we play, have a place to play in that by not giving them a pass on weight bearing activity and load share, because that's going to decrease their incidence of stress fracture, decrease their incidence of putting all the placement onto one spot of their bone that might be osteopenic osteoporotic. Uh, teaching team members, anybody else want to share what you would think? Oh. oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. You, you just went quiet on your end there for a second. Sorry. No, but I, no, but I'd imagine though too, especially like with the idea set up of, uh, of of not treating these patients differently or not treating them as you know, well, you've come in with this limitation, so therefore you can't do the same amount as other people. Why not? It puts them through that movements and just kind of allows for for that to kind of stay. It's, it's, I'd imagine it'd be something along the lines of where the, 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 the more you use it, the less you use it, or the 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 the, the, the more you use it, the less you lose it. So, uh, so, so keeping a platform where, you know, able to move, able to learn how to especially move properly, um, it, it's going to help down the road when, when situations arise that, 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 that could be problematic. Totally. I, I, I love that, that, oh, you're osteopenic. Let's let this be like a really good opportunity for you to understand how to not get a stress fracture that can evolve into a fracture. I love mm -hmm. that. That's really great. Well, well, when it seems like too, when things are brought to people's attention, they, they, they tend to they tend to focus more on it and really kind of understand it because it, it's not just you know words them or it's not just uh, uh, something that somebody else deals with. It's, it's, it's something that directs them involvedly so, or directs them uh, directly. So as a result, it's going to uh, they, they, they're going to pay, pay more attention to it. Absolutely, Kirby, you had a hand up. Do you want to share something? I think you're muted, Kirby. You know. Anna and James. There you go, Curb. Sorry. Can you hear me? No, yes. that's fine. I was just going to back up what Anna and Danny said because if if we're not loading, we need to that joint and those bones need to learn how to load and you know compress and decompress through movement. So if we train through our IDQs and training then we're not going to abnormally load that different part of that femoral neck or whatever that they find. So we're going to maintain proper load sharing within that. Perfect. I, I love, I love, yeah, uh, that way we can learn that load. And load. Oh, we lost you. Sorry. Go ahead, Curb. Oh, that's, 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 no, that's okay. I, I was about, I was pretty much done just saying that, um, you know, if, if, if we can train, and, and maintain all the cues, then it'll properly compress and decompress as it should, as it's designed, not in these abnormal, you know, these other structures that are, that we find in the, in the fracture, or we're actually going to create the correct piezoelectric effect, you know, to maintain proper, uh, proper uh, weight bearing in the right areas. That's my husband's word of the week or phrase of the week is piezoelectric effect. We started talking about that and he was like, what? That is like the coolest, it's like the coolest topic ever. 
the fact that you have like this electricity system in your body that we actually can make bones dense through just compressing them by just load bearing on them. And a lot of the really good medical doctors tell their patients, look, you're osteopenic. You need to, you need to do weight bearing exercise. But then they don't also tell them that you need to make sure that any kind of dysfunctional movements you have prevent what Kirby's talking about, which is be, being able to produce compressive and decompressive loads that don't favor the patient that load the wrong part and that can actually encourage a stress fracture in them. So it is important to do load bearing activity. It's very important to do load shared load bearing activity. And that is what we're all about in ID. I love, love, love that you said that, Kirby. That was great. Well, um, and also Lisa, too. Oh, sorry, Anna. Sorry, Anna. Well, um, I was just going to say also too, like with, I mean, you know, the, the idea of how the limitations of the DEXA scan may or may not be controversial, whatever, what's not controversial is exactly what you just said though, is that research does show that the best way to support this is through weight bearing. And so, you know, if you can have load sharing and weight bearing, I, I don't think anybody's going to argue with you that that's the best way to do it. And, you know, with, with fractures and things like that, the first thing that's done is um, you stay off of it. Right. And, and like, you know, maybe you could argue staying off of something for the first week and a half, two weeks until a callus starts to form. But in, you know, in, in acupuncture, we use the Easton machines with the microcurrent because the speeding up of fry, I mean, this is just manipulating that piezoelectric effect. It actually has a bone knitting effect when you start to stimulate those osteoblasts and try to produce a, a callus formation for somebody who can't load bear because the fracture is too acute, you can sort of surround it and then really blast an area with a microcurrent. It's basically a, a, a soft version of stress to the area. You want, you want Wolf's Law to happen. You want things like that to try to lay down new, um, new osteoblasts so that they can start to repair an area. So, um, you know, I, there's plenty of different ways in which you can meet somebody in this um, weight bearing. And I, I, and I think that, you know, if it's perceived to be controversial, whatever, I don't think it, when it's all said and done with it, anybody would argue that, you know, teaching somebody to be upright and, and load sharing in a way that's safe is, that's certainly not anything to be perceived as controversial. I have to agree with you. I mean, we have podiatrists for people with stress fractures, giving them bone density machines that are very much like microcurrent mm -hmm. and they've been used for a very long time and they are still considered a, a little bit controversial, which is so interesting to me because it just basically is using electricity to help you make bones more dense, which is what you do when you have ground force contact. Right. So if we had to simplify this entire situation and make like a new ID motto, it would be load share, then load bear. <laughs> and, and that's what we do in, in immaculate dissection anyway. We teach somebody how to load share properly and then we keep making it more difficult, whether it's frequency, duration, load, total load, uh, all of those can build strength uh, around something and, and bones need strength. So uh, Lisa, you had something you wanted to say too? Yeah, I was just kind of uh, gonna, and you basically just said it, but like going back to the, if we don't assess them this, the way that we assess everyone else, and we talked about this a lot last week, um, we're basically going to miss the opportunity to set them up for that load share before they load bear. Um, so it's, it's basically, yeah, it's, you know, just because someone has a diagnosis, not to get distracted by that and to just focus on treating them and assessing them um, the same way that we would any other thing that walks into our office. I love that. Lisa, people don't know maybe that weren't on the call before this, but we had a team meeting call and Lisa was talking about, uh, making sure how to minimize the noise, uh, which I loved. Like when, when a client gets, just hits you with a wall of information and, and, and you wanna be compassionate, but you also want to minimize the noise in their head too. I have this, I have this, 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 and this. And like, okay, awesome. You know, you are thriving, you are not fragile. And look, look at this, just because you're osteopenic does not mean you're fragile. It just means that you might need a little bit more of what Dr. Anna was talking about or Kirby was talking about or what Lisa's talking about. And so you can help them calm their own noise by calming the noise yourself and learning a standard operating system of load share than load bear. Uh, love it, I love it. Really, really helpful. Uh, awesome. Um, the next question was posed by Martha, who I believe is on this call. Hi, Martha. 
uh, she asked two questions, uh, one of which um, I think is, is a really popular question that gets asked to us a lot. She is an idealist. She's taken some ID courses with us. And so she's already doing amazing optimizations on her clients. And if I recall, uh, she's taken ID one, two, three, and six with us. I think maybe that's correct. She'll let me know if I'm wrong about that. Hi, Martha. Um, she asked this question. Um, if someone's been consistent with like breathing drills, core strategy drills, like supine 90, 90, crocodile, uh, but continues to have bilateral knee bends on their load shared flexion test, which for us is a toe touch, right? Um, how can we uh, basically encourage them to get past a state where they're no longer holding hamstring tension? Hopefully I have that question correct. Um, and Martha, let me know if I need to elaborate using the chat box. Uh, I, I love this question because I feel like uh, a lot of people have lost the dynamism of their hamstrings because the hamstrings are attempting to decelerate the lumbar spine. So let's start there. So in immaculate dissection one, two, three, four, six, <laughs> we put people through a toe touch and overhead reach to determine if they have load share in their ability to flex and extend on the sagittal plane. We call this load shared flexion and load shared extension. And in a toe touch, what we'll see in a lot of people is a bilateral knee bend. And anything bilateral to us uh, that looks compensatory like that uh, is usually an intrinsic core stability problem. What Martha's pointing out is the person tends to have uh, anterior chain issues, although I will piggyback up on it in a second because I don't think it only has to be anterior chain. Um, I think it's just a sign of intrinsic core stability loss. And our intrinsic muscles uh, that we talk about in immaculate dissection that tend towards kind of down regulation would be things like transversus abdominis, internal abdominal oblique, multifidus, and lumbar erectors. And when these structures are not able to keep the trunk stable over uh, this moving part uh, of center of mass, then your body will create a way to have stability around its center of mass. And it, when your lumbar spine is, is unstable or the pelvis is unstable, the, the body will create a knee bend in the hamstrings. And so the hamstrings can slow down the movement of the lumbar spine in that flexed position via their execution of force on the sacred tuberous ligament that then connects to dorsal sacral iliac ligament and then thus can connect to multifidus and lumbar rectors and basically giving them support. But then it costs you something. It costs you the dynamism of the hamstring because now you play, essentially placed a parking brake on your ability to be able to move the lumbar spine. And people that have had a threatened lumbar spine, you see them a toe touch and they don't flex at all. They can stay in a full maintained lordosis or even sometimes coach to do so. And I understand why, because they're not trying to re-exacerbate, skeet shoot the discs posterolaterally out the back. They're, they're trying to decelerate and trying to protect. But it does take time if the hamstrings have lost their dynamism to gain permission to be dynamic again. So just because you've been doing a couple of months of supine 90-90 and crocodile breathing doesn't mean necessarily that you're, not, you're gonna get rid of that bilateral knee bend. You're, you're going to have to build strength and fortitude on top of that stable platform in order for the, the hamstrings to give, regain their dynamism. Then you have to retrain the hamstrings to be dynamic again, assuming that you have all those IDQs set, neck long, chin tuck, chest wide, ribs down, hips even, which means these people have to learn how to lunge. And so I'm gonna pull up a picture for you of what's called the deep longitudinal subsystem. It is something that we talk about in Immaculate Dissection 6, although we do hint on it in one quite a bit. And Danny's gorgeous art of this bulimian subsystem is present here. So you get a sneak peek into an ID course should you ever choose to take one. This is ID 6. Now Martha, I think, has access to this course, so she's seen this, and so this probably will hit home for her. As you can see in the green here, these are green means go, primary synergists. So we have multifidus, lumbar erectors, connecting through the dorsal sacro iliac ligament, through the sacro tuberous ligament, and onto the long head, biceps femoris. And this is how we create pelvic stability in the sagittal plane when you're standing on one leg during uh, single limb support, or when you're trying to push off a limb during uh, the propulsive state of gait known as terminal stance, right? When the leg's behind you like on a lunge. And so these have to be working on both sides of your body at any given moment to be able to maintain sagittal plane stability. And so if a person has a bilateral knee bend, then this means that the person has bilateral deep longitudinal subsystem issues, which means they have a centralized sagittal plane problem, basically center of the spine, right? 
So now that you've seen that, you can understand how the hamstring will protect itself from tearing by bending the knee during the toe touch if it's attempting to decelerate the speed of the lumbar spine. So you have to build up enough core stability to give permission for the hamstring to relax into being dynamic. And then you have to train the dynamism of that hamstring. And the way we do that in immaculate dissection is through lunge training. We put you through enormous lunge training. But before we ever let you lunge, we put you through neural developmental stages. And so Kirby, maybe I can pull you on for that since you are uh, DNS A through D, and maybe you can unmute yourself. And Kirby, you've, you've uh, assisted ID6 in New York, and you remember us going through things like modified Superman, uh, going through a 4.5 month position, all these positions that are training uh, the DLS. Can you speak a little bit on how one earns the right to, to regain their hamstring dynamism through neural developmental positioning? Sure. Um, you know, as in development, we moved um, basically from three months supine to three months prone. Um, and then after that, if we watch that baby, even the human being develop from the third to fourth month, I know we hit on it a lot in ID1 about how it took one month to gain 10 degrees of, of hip flexion. Uh, beginning the, and as we started uh, moving that hip flexion further, uh, then we learned to roll from supine to prone, uh, it basically, you start gaining intral abdominal pressure with, um, that will help from core. And then the DLS actually helps us uh, finish out turning to the prone position. Um, then the baby will start uprighting itself uh, from that three month prone position off the elbows, uh, more to the forearm in the five month and all the way up to the hand in six. But uh, allowing it to do that, uh, it must maintain intra abdominal pressure to maintain lordosis of the lumbar spine. And then you start seeing a little bit of flexion in the knees. And this is how we're starting to gain even dynamism from the hamstring, learning how to shorten and lengthen uh, from that early, early development stage as it develops up to the 11 month high kneel or lunge position. So it takes a lot is the point to Martha's question. It's not just going to be like, Oh, I've done some supine 90, 90 and some dime bug. And now my hamstrings are going to let go of their position. No way, no way before the, the baby would even stand up and correct me if I'm wrong, Kirby, they had to have a hundred degrees of the humeral movement, which means they have to have a good, they have to earn their 15 to 20 degrees of thoracic extension, which means they have to have proper spinal load share throughout the entire system to then propel themselves into a lunge and take someone with a bilateral knee bend on a toe touch and ask them to do a lunge bilaterally. It looks like a crap show. And the reason why, and they ask them if they like lunging, they usually will tell you no to, that they don't like it. Because they, uh, you need the hamstrings to be able to push you from that tall kneel into a standing position. And so it is not an easy thing to earn back hamstring dynamism after you've lost it. It is one of the primary reasons people get hamstring strains. It's one of the primary reasons why people get neural tension, like sciatica, uh, true sciatica. It's one of the reasons that Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, all rooted back to the fact that they've lost hamstring dynamism and lost proper lumbar support. So we highly suggest... Yeah, you can... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you even see that uh, even uh, putting them in, I know we've talked about it before, uh, just uh, when we put them in, in quadruped and it's starting to see them rock back and forth, you really see that a deep longitudinal system, you'll start really seeing their, where the hamstrings attach on the condyles below on the tibia. You'll see the tibia start raising up. They cannot maintain them on the ground. That's so true. Like we'll put them into basic, a, a rock, like a quadruped rock, and, and they just try to get them to rock back and forth like a, like a modified squat position. And yeah, it looks nuts. They, 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 they can't control their pelvis. They're, they're going all over the place. They're increasing their lumbar lower dosage, just like they would do in a toe touch. And, um, uh, so it, it does take a while to earn back your dynamism. It, it takes a lot of due diligence to earn back your dynamism. So uh, we highly suggest that people take ID1 and put them through core progressions. And we have core strengthening exercises that are in quadruped, things called quadruped alternates, 
uh, quadruped crawling variations that are very helpful to help restore dynamism. And then once you are uh, have a little bit less of the knee bend, uh, you can start to work them through um, ID2 corrective strategies, which is basically the ground up, trying to get them to focus on which one of these sides is a little worse, and then working them through uh, the get up, the ID get up patterns, uh, which we think are, are really, really valuable. So um, the big moral of the story is, if the person has a bilateral knee bend, they have a lot more work to do than just supine 90-90 and crocodile breathing. It's going to take some time, and what, which is why in ID1, we give people strength progressions to do. And uh, the last uh, big progression that we do involves quadruped, what Kirby's talking about, which is quadruped alternates. There's a great video of Monica doing this. It's completely free. Uh, it's on our Immaculate Dissection uh, Facebook page and on our Immaculate Dissection Instagram. If you shoot me an email, I'm happy to send you over the link to her doing it. And she shows her own limitation and shows her own core stability problems that she's had with discogenic back pain. Hopefully I'm not oversharing, Monica, because you talk about it in the video. So I'm assuming I'm not oversharing. Let me know if I am. Um, and uh, she talks about her own limitations and she, you watch her limit herself on the video, which we've had several emails about thanking us for Monica showing that she is not perfect but she's earning the right back to more load shared movement. And so it, it does take due diligence and it will take time to, to improve your dynamism. But the moral of the story is start with core stability strategies, carry those core stability strategies into retraining hamstring, hamstring dynamism. And you can learn pretty much all of that at the ID1, ID2 coursework. And then ID6 is movement subsystems where we talk about where you see this picture again that Danny drew for the DLS. Uh, wonderful. Looks like we got some questions from the galleries, making sure, uh, from Martha. I'm studying DLS now in subsystems. Great explanation. Oh, great. Oh, I was hoping that answered your question, Martha, because, you know, I'm long-winded. But Kirby was not, and he, I liked his succinctness, and, and he described the, the getup very well. Now, Martha, you had a secondary question. I hope it's okay that I'm going right into that. Uh, but she, her next question was, if you have time, you discuss true sciatica uh, in the DLS, a sciatic nerve entrapment by the long head uh, biceps femoris uh, in the DLS, and then how you can, why piriformis gets blamed for all sciatica, and, and how you can relate that DLS to long head biceps. I love this question so much, Martha, that I want to high five you wherever you are. I think you're in Boston area, so uh, very nice question. I love it. Um, most people don't show up with bilateral sciatica, right? Most people show up with a unilateral sciatica. And assuming that it's true sciatic neuropathy and not radiculopathy, um, the difference being that sciatic nerve is L4 to S3 and radiculopathy is one spinal nerve level, usually distributed by a sciatic nerve. So those things are a little different. If you want to learn how to differentiate them, take ID5. But other than that, um, the, the DLS being an issue with pretty much any of those, sciatic neuropathy and radiculopathy, the the person will have a unilateral knee bend on the toe touch uh they'll bend the knee on the side of sciatic issue and um i find in my clinical practice and i since i have a little bit of time on my hands i was looking back at the sciatic nerve cases that i have that were actually piriformis issues in the last five years since catalyst has been open six years the catalyst has been open one one was caused by piriformis, and then so many, we're talking about in the hundreds now, of people with sciatic presentations that were caused by long head biceps femoris and their relationship to multifidus, the, so DLS. I'm not saying that piriformis isn't ever involved. Of course, it's a femoral centrator. It has a sciatic nerve running directly anterior to it. Of course, it can be involved in sciatic neuropathy. I just find a lot more that it's long head biceps femoris and that a lot more people have a DLS issue than they actually have a true piriformis issue. And I know we talked about this on the first call where we showed Danny's amazing art on the greater sciatic notch and how everybody blames everything in your butt on piriformis. But what you're feeling with a lot of people in that greater sciatic notch area is neurovascular bundles and not actually piriformis itself. And so while piriformis can entrap the sciatic nerve, long head biceps can do, can do a beautiful job of that, particularly in the DLS. And so with our standard operating system, piriformis would be more of a transverse plane problem, right? And this is a sagittal plane problem. Hamstrings don't have a ton of rotation involved with them on any other axis other than the sagittal plane movement, x-axis. 
So if, if you're finding in your clinical assessments, the person has a, a solid anterior pelvic belt and has a locked long biceps femoris and a knee bend on their toe touch, especially unilateral, you better be going after hamstring and not piriformis. And we can't emphasize that enough. And I just was so excited to see that Martha asked that question because I don't think you can learn that enough and hear that enough before you walk away from everybody blaming everything on piriformis and start blaming things on the DLS. And I know that the teaching team has things to say about this. So who wants to go first? And I'll mute myself. Yes, Dr. Folkmer. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it, the DLS is the point at which something that, you know, could have been a, a bilateral presentation has now just trickled into a unilateral presentation. Like you've just cleared that bilateral issue. So the fact that you're gonna see that unilateral presentation first is, is way before, like you said, that you would get into these like little tiny intrinsic muscles of the butt that, you know, of course they're important, but it's just not gonna be the thing. And, and one thing in, in dissection that I like to do with my students is, try to um, make them come up with the same conclusion. And so when we're in the lab and we're dissecting it, well, like, I'm like, and look at this long head biceps and the sciatic nerve. And they're like, whoa, whoa, my God, that's so cool. And their heads are exploding and everything's amazing. And then I'm like, and, here, and here's piriformis. Like at that point, like it's like probably atrophied a little bit and, and they go, Oh my gosh, I'm Dr. Pokemon, how does that how does that give you so many sciatic problems? And I'm like, I don't know. You tell me. Like, do you think it's gonna tell you it's gonna create these sciatic problems? And they're like, well, it seems like long head biceps would create so many more. I'm like, I think so too. I think you're on to something. And so we have like I try, just kind of slide it in there and like try to fish it out from them. You know, it's like let's make them think that this is their idea and then they're going to automatically, you know, remember this forever and then hopefully carry it into their clinical lives because totally it's true, right? You're asking the hamstrings to do two jobs at once and it's like you're speeding through the yellow lights and at some point, like clinically, when I have people that come in to see me who have um, careers built on, on, on flexibility and, you know, they're contortionists and they're people that, you know, have crazy range of motions and I watch their toe touch and I see that I am scared to death for them because I know that they have the ability to night after night day after day and whatever their practices are surpass that threshold and and that they don't necessarily have permission to move in the way that they are and so it you know it's kind of a scary thing because then they'll go oh I'm just not warmed up and it's like I don't know. I think we got to respect what, what we're finding here and, and learn a little bit more about it and, um, and, and listen to what your body's trying to educate us on because there's an opportunity to have both, to have extensibility and stability. So um, yeah, I, I love looking at this in the lab though, because it's like little baby piriformis and then like a long head biceps. <laughs> it's huge. I, I it's think awesome. People think piriformis is huge in your butt. Yeah. Piriformis means pear-shaped, right? And piriformis, the pear, like the top of the pear, you know, the little part that nobody really eats that much. Usually I give it to my puppy, right? <laughs> the, the, the top part, that's what's in your butt. The, the little top part. The big wide part is actually intrapelvic, mm -hmm. forming the posterior part of the pelvic wall, which you're going to have to go intravaginally or intraanally to even approach, right? It, it's not really that. And then the, the sacral and, and lower lumbar ventral rami are basically on the surface of piriformis and, and they're not really impacted by it. You know, piriformis is kind of piecemeal, kind of like psoas in a big way. And then as you come out of the sciatic notch, yes, there is very little room for things to move around. There's sciatic nerve, there's piriformis, superior and inferior gluteal nerve, vascular bundle, internal pudendal nerve artery and vein. I'm sorry, pudendal nerve, internal pudendal artery and vein. So there's a lot coming out. And so yes, piriformis is a site and we will never say that it's not. But in our assessments in ID2, we tell you exactly on the patient, is it or isn't it? Is this created by a sagittal plane problem or a transverse frontal plane problem? So you'll be able to find out in 30 seconds if it's really piriformis as the culprit or the much more frequent times when it's hamstring involvement. And so we're really excited for that question and, and, and very happy that Martha asked it. I love it. Um, anybody else want to add before I ask, answer Grinder's question? Because I love this topic. Okay, we got too excited and we just talked too much. <laughs> I, I don't. I, 
And then I'm like, dang it. I, I, like Monica was probably thinking the exact same thing and I stole her thunder. Uh, so just put a hand up and stop me because, oh, and there's Danny, yes. Yeah, just, just to kind of chime in a little bit on stuff though too, like uh, when, when, when parts or when, when, when certain structures are being overworked and asked to do multiple jobs and what they're in designed for, it's gonna reach that point where it kind of screams out and yells, you know, like just stop this. Like it, it just needs a point to kind of turn it down. So it totally makes sense that if hamstrings are stabilizing the pelvis on top of having like a, a poor core or a core that can't stabilize itself, it's going to make sense that you're going to start getting some really loud noise down there. So That's exactly right. Remember, this is not us giving us you permission to foam roll your hamstring or to like dig in with whatever tool you got in your kitchen. Uh, one of my patients used a rolling pin, which I thought very interesting. Uh, the, it's basically telling us to assess the relationships of the low back and hamstring. We're not saying just go to town on your hamstring. Because remember, if something's tight, it's usually because it has to be. It, it, it needs assessment and encouragement to be dynamic again. Uh, okay, love, love, love that topic so much. Um, I, I wanna make sure we get to Grinder's question, which is a really good one. Grinder, we love your questions. Martha, awesome questions. These are so good. You guys are just, Amazing idealists, we love it. Um, Grinder's question, uh, he notices professionals in, I assume fitness industry, because he's a, a trainer, yes, uh, in our industry often framing conversations around mobility and stability as mobility versus stability, and asking which is more important, ah, neither, and what comes first, neither, oh my gosh. Uh, I, I love this question. For me, they're so intertwined, they cannot be separated. We believe the same, Render. Um, it's not mobility versus stability. It's mobility, stability, and strength in a trifecta, where not one is more important than the other. And you have to, the whole point of load share is being stable and then moving around a stable platform. It's not one or the other. It's always both. Because let me tell you what, I don't sit in supine 90, 90, 24, 7, 365. There's going to have to be some movement, some ambulation, right? So I need to permit mobility without sacrificing stability. I need to permit stability without sacrificing mobility. I have to have a little tango that we do together to make sure that you're not robbing one to pay the other one. And, and that's ID principle. We agree with you 100%, Grinder, that's not versus. And it's also not stability versus strength. Um, it, it is the even trifecta. We'd want people to be strong. But if you're strong on an unstable platform, it's like building your house on quicksand. It's, it's going down, baby. No matter how strong you made the outside, the foundation sucks, boom, it's done. And uh, we've seen equal problems with people like mobilizing the crap out of their joints and it's mobilize, 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 which is probably more frequent than not. And then those people developing parking brakes on their tissues, like it used to move really well and now it doesn't. I wish I would have moved back like I did when I was 20. Well, maybe when you were 20, you moved like crap. You know, you moved way too unstable or, or like made, moved way too much on an unstable platform. So hypostability and hypermobility may not be the same thing, right? And we, we definitely, and ID want to look at how things are load shared, which for us is stability, and then permitting movement on a stable platform and then putting strength on top of that mobile and stable load shared situation and we agree 100 percent grinder it is not versus that mobility and stability are equally important and then don't forget strength which is one third of any strong triangle you got to have three big parts that are easily maintained and it's those three i know the teaching team definitely wants to comment on this so so who's got it who wants to go first raise your hand no yes Ah, there you go, Monica. Um, just something to add to that was, you know, until basically ID for me, I felt really lost and I felt very much that it was, everything was versus one another rather than how do we create this ability to level up everything together? And until you know, I took core, it, it just didn't make sense to me. I was just like, okay, so I'm going to be strength training, but then I have this injury, so then I'm just going to be doing stability work, but then I got to move, so I'm just, how is this going to work? <laughs> so I think it's a really great question for sure, is, is removing the verses, and it's, it's an and. It's attaching all of them. 
Monica, you also own a gym. You're you're a chiropractor. You're a uh, ID practitioner also, and, and you also own a gym. So you must see this a lot. People that put strength on an unstable platform or add mobility to an unstable platform or do too much stability work and not enough mobility and, and strength training. How, how can you comment on that? Uh, you know, that that's kind of why I wanted the clinic that I have. It's being able to marry all three facets nicely and actually seeing it play out because I think as practitioners, we're very focused on, you know, what the patient's coming in with at that moment. We don't get to see the rest of the process. So for me, I love it because I get to work with other people who are now taking care of the other part of that triangle. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else want to comment? Lisa. I think um, even for myself um, in, in how these things integrate, I think a lot of like any mobility issues that I've had have generated from a stability issue. So if I continued to mobilize, it only got worse over time. So I think when we kind of think about them versus um, you get stuck in a loop uh, a lot of the time of I'm releasing, I'm releasing, I'm releasing, I'm releasing. And it's only getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. So your mo my mobility problem is becoming worse and worse and worse and worse because I brought the wrong solution um, to the problem. So the integration is so key. And if we think about them as separate entities, you're going to miss the real solution to the problem, um, which was as soon as I started doing stability work, those mobility issues went away. Um, yeah. That's so great. Um, we are posting a video tomorrow on femoral centration, and I, I share the same thing. I experienced the same thing as Lisa, where I had what I perceived to be a, a right hip mobility issue because it just always hurt all the time, always felt tight. And I would do stretches, and it would buy me some time, right? Because it would bring blood flow to the site, and it would, you know, desensitize me to the situation. If I stretched it, I wouldn't, you know, and then it, it worked until it didn't. And we say that an idea a lot like stretch, foam roll, do those things if you want as a sole entity. But if it stops working, then you can't keep doing that and expect a different result. And uh, I was the same as Lisa. I was bringing mobility corrections to a stability problem, did not have proper load share. And then it wasn't until I did some stability work that I didn't have to do as much mobility work anymore, didn't feel the need to have to do it, and figured out I didn't have a mobility problem in the first place. I had a hypo stability problem, not a hyper mobility problem, not a hyper oh, mobility problem. It was, you know, me not being able to share the, the love between mobility and stability. Definitely not versus, and as Monica said, and. So love it. Uh, any other, other teaching team members? Yes, Mo uh, Anna. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, you know, I, to me, this mimics a yin and yang balance in Chinese medicine so much. It's It would never, ever, ever be a question of which one do you you know, are, are you treating this today versus are you treating this today? It's really about what can you, what is this person sort of asking permission for? What is it, what can you bring to this person's experience with where they currently are? You know, do you have permission to mobilize them? Um, and once they're stable enough, are you mobilizing them? Um, and, and, you know, this can vary. There's so many different ways in which this can show up. I mean, and, and it's always interesting when people tend to be kind of attracted to the thing that they're really good at too, which can also kind of cloud your perspective, your perceptive perception of, of what you need. Um, I mean, I can tell you a lot of things I think I need. <laughs> <laughs> None of them are correct. So, I mean, and that's like, I, I think when people are, you know, they would say things like football players need to take dance and dancers should not play football. They should lift with some things. I don't know. But like, I, I think that that's essentially what's, what's being referred to here is that, you know, what, where is your body and what is it that can enhance that situation? And just like Monica said, you know, this is a yin and yang balance of mobility and stability. It should you should never put one up against the other. It's really about there. These are mutually in, interdependent and and they coexist together. So how do you harmonize the two um, for an overall you know um, a platform that you can start to build strength on top of so that they don't get injured? So um, it's a really interesting thing to look at and. Um, and I mean, I even, you know, take this further sometimes in my practice of like, 
where, what does that person need today? Like even with, um, you know, uh, how to coordinate this with even like menstrual cycles and things like that. Like sometimes when does a person need to be moved and when does a person need to, to start to stabilize and tonify and, and really support and build up. Um, and I, I always try to mimic their movement with their um, sort of internal chemistry as well, um, just for a more holistic picture. Love it. That's awesome. Uh, so hopefully we answered that question and <laughs> we're also emphatic about it from a very personal place that I think that's why we gravitated towards ID because uh, one of the big ideas that we have is, is to low chair and then encourage mobility once something has an awareness of, of centration and, and yeah, not one or the other, but both. There, there's, both are to be respected and don't forget strength. It's left out strength buys you a lot of time. And uh, once you have a, a mobile, st stable load share, uh, it's certainly wonderful to build strength on top of it. You can become quite the machine. Um, awesome. Yes. <laughs> Grinder says, thank you for answering emphatically. I, I, I don't know if we know any other way. <laughs> we get so excited about this anatomy stuff. Um, oh my God, it's six o'clock already. I can't believe that happened so fast. So I've got to give a, a, a question to these amazing people. And here's your chance to get 50 bucks off. I hope you know where the chat box is. Maybe you should practice right now. And so the chat box again is down to the left of the green button that says share screen. And if you uh, want to get 50 bucks off, you can answer this question correctly right now. I hope you're ready. Okay. I need, if you can answer for me, three structures of the deep longitudinal subsystem. Go. We covered it today. Everybody excited or I'm excited. Yes, Grinder for the win. Grinder. Uh, so Grinder, you get $50 off uh, your uh, ID, ID, next ID course. And then we're gonna put you on block after this. He won last week. So we're gonna have to put him on block and get somebody else to win. <laughs> People are gonna start getting mad at you, Grinder. Uh, no, 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 don't feel bad. No, 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 no. We were just kidding. Uh, no, we're very excited to give you this coupon. We want you to, to take some ID courses with us. So uh, the uh, coupon you can get from Dr. Anna Folkmer. She's going to go into the chat box and write a macula dissection at Gmail to, so you can get your $50 off coupon. And then come back next Sunday, folks, for your chance to get $50 off a course. It will always be something in the talk, and I'll give you a chance to, to get some money off. Before we leave you, we have an exciting announcement. We have the official launch on Friday of our ID Collaborative. Now, you guys were a big motivating factor in us starting this, so we're very excited. Uh, Dr. Folkmore uh, can share with you, too, uh, the fact that she has built our website for us. She's amazing. And on www.immaculatedissection.com, if you go there now, there'll be a big orange pop-up box, and it'll invite you to not only take our online courses, uh, in-person courses once they can actually run, uh, but the ID Collaborative. The ID Collaborative will be a week-long, or sorry, a year-long lecture series that you can either get uh, study uh, learning hours a la carte, or you can get them as part of a membership. And, and the ID Collaborative membership, uh, you pay $200 for the year, and we give you at least four learning hours per month, uh, minimum. And in May, we have five already <laughs> covered for you. And basically what you do is you get access to each one of our topics and uh, you can come live or you can get the recording afterwards or both. And uh, each of the talks will be an hour long. Dr. Anna and I will be hopefully at each one of them, a minimum. And some of your ID teaching team members and also Danny Cork, co-founder, uh, may be in a couple as well. And uh, what we'll be talking about is a variety of topics over the year and uh, we want to send you guys some really great information, but we don't want it to break your bank. So when you average it out, uh, it costs about $16.67 US per month to get a minimum four hours of learning. In fact, there'll be a lot more than four hours. We just wanted to give you a bare minimum of four. And you'll um, have some great opportunities for learning. You can learn all about it at immaculatedissection.com. The, there'll be a tab at the top that says ID Collaborative. And you can click on that. It's also right under the calendar of events, ID Collaborative, and you can read about all the things that you would get from this, which is a lot. 
And so we wanted to give an opportunity for you to come in with us every single week live, answer some of your live questions. And also you can uh, give us some questions beforehand if you can't make it to the talk like we do with the Ask Us Anything. Ask Us Anything will always remain free for you. We're gonna come in and, and answer your questions like this. But we wanted to make it topic based and have a whole hour where we share peer reviewed literature, our ID concepts, uh, the way that we feel about anatomy and, uh, and provide a really healthy cost efficient learning environment for you. So we're super excited to announce that for you. So if you'd like, you can share in your chat box your email address right now, if you want, and then we can add you to our mailing list because I'll, tomorrow I'll be sending out an email all about ID Collaborative and, and hopefully you'll join the membership. And if you're not ready for a membership, maybe just join in on a couple of the talks a la carte and you can always transfer that into a membership later. So, uh, so excited to, to be a part of that with this amazing ID teaching team. And we have some really cool topics coming up, everything from gait to biomechanics of breathing to uh, gender affirmation and how to communicate in a clinical situation with your clients, make them feel safe. We have so many amazing opportunities just in May. I think, Anna, you had said that May alone gets you, I think, $125 towards your membership, right? Just in the month of May. Yeah. For the talks. Yeah, yeah if you to... join us with in, in the month of May, you, the membership is already, you know, halfway paid for if you um, joined us for every single talk in May. So, um, and at any point, if you decide to join us, you know, you still, if, if May is a tough month for you, because like we know that it is for a lot of people and you decide to join us in July, it, it, that's fine. You still get a backlog of everything that we've already covered in May and June. No matter what, like we will have a year of content. We'll have a minimum, bare minimum, 52 talks for 200 bucks. So when you do the math on that, it's crazy cheap. It's like $4, you know, per learning hour. So, uh, and we'll have more than that too. We're gonna, that's just the bare minimum. And we will have special features that will unlock for the ID members. Uh, you know, we didn't want you guys to have to pay a lot of money, especially in the midst of a pandemic to learn, but we also want to, you know, really encourage your learning process. We want you to, to be a part of a, a collaboration of people with a similar mindset. So we figured the best, most cost efficient, most productive way to do it was to, to start the ID collaborative. So we're so happy to talk about some pretty cool topics with you. I think one of them is even Bell's palsy this month, which is a really popular topic that people have a hard time kind of understanding and treating. I know Dr. Anna will have a lot to say about that and Chinese medicine protocols for Bell's palsy. So I think that you'll be really interested in some of the topics. And if you're not interested in one of the topics, believe me, there are four or five more coming that month. They're, they're gonna be great ones and you'll be able to watch all of them for that year retro dated, uh, which is, is hugely valuable because maybe you weren't interested in Bell's palsy in May, but you certainly got really interested in October when you had two patients walk in with it. So you might find that collective amount of, of, of info really, really valuable. So we'll send you some information on that if you include your email in the chat box. Uh, I will email you uh, tomorrow evening, uh, inviting you to, to join the ID uh, Collaborative membership. And if you're not ready, totally cool, we'll be here, remember, for you for the next year, May 15th to May 14th of next year, uh, the, the year will run. But we're just super excited to announce that we're, I mean, Anna and I are just geeking out like crazy over coming to your house every week and keeping you excited about learning and not letting you get too mind bottled or boggled or whatever you call it, uh, it, it when you're being at home and, and not being able to learn as much as you maybe would like in a live situation. But we want to be able to, to keep you stimulated and keep you learning so that uh, when things get back to a new normal, you feel really invigorated and uh, hopefully uh, you guys can help us with some topics too that you want covered. We'll add that to to the list as, as an ID collaborative member. So thank you so much for joining us this week. Again, put your email to, to the right under the chats if you want to be included in that email tomorrow night. If not, I won't email you. And uh, we would love to have you on the next Ask Us Anything every Sunday until this uh, pandemic ends at least, uh, 5 p.m. We will continue to Ask Us Anything for as long as you let us because we're having way too much fun to cut it out now. Uh, so thank you so much for your time and attention. ID teaching team, do you have anything else to add uh, that I missed or any uh, sayonaras you want to give? Thank you guys. If you're if, happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. And also, um, yeah, if you think that we're emphatic about answering one question, Jesus Christ, give us an hour and <laughs> on one topic. <laughs> It'll be a blast. Truth. No truer statement ever told. 
so we, we thank you all so much. Uh, we will be uploading this to YouTube uh, within the next 24 hours. Look for this recording on Immaculate Dissection's Facebook page. And I will also, uh, you know, have it on YouTube. So you can just go to YouTube and search it as well. So uh, thank you very much for your, for your time and attention and amazing questions tonight. Every week, I feel, they just kind of keep growing into these amazing masses of questions. So hopefully you'll return back with us. And if not, you'll send us a question so we can cover it and you can catch it on the flip side. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll see you next Sunday. Bye.